Great is thy faithfulness, right? Yeah. It's something that um, we as evangelists have been keeping in our minds frequently as we're going out. You know, teenagers can be, teenagers and boosters can be pretty scary. You know, they're very, very closed off a lot of times and just, you know, just stay faithful to God and he'll do the rest, right? Yeah. I find it, I, I've, I've found a lot of times that God has a funny way of working things out. I don't, I don't know if I had told Pastor what I was going to be preaching when he made this, but the creation moment talked about fireflies and about how they refract light and everything. And um, we read in our passage in Matthew chapter 5 about being the light of the world. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I think God that worked that out for a reason. So if you're in your Bible in Matthew chapter 5, we read verses 14 through 16. And I want to give you this thought. You are God's choice to be the light of the gospel to our world. You are God's choice to be the light of the gospel to our world. Can you imagine what it would have been like to hear Jesus preach? You know, he never, he never misspoke. He, he always knew what he was going to say and how he was going to say it. And it even says that after he was done preaching that the people marveled at what he said. Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 says, It came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. It's in this sermon that we just read in Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus said this startling phrase, Ye are the light of the world. God could have chosen many different ways to show himself to his creation. He could have had the angels come down and speak to us. He could have had animals just all of a sudden start talking, proclaiming it. He could have written a message in the sky. He could have had the rocks start crying out. But he chose us, Christians, to be the ones to proclaim his gospel to our world. This passage that we just read compels all believers to get the message of the gospel to our lost and dying world. It's our assignment. This is what we've been given. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. A disciple is someone that has chosen to trust Jesus and to follow after him. So he is speaking to his disciples who have decided to trust and follow him, as well as now to us who have also decided to trust and follow him. And he tells us, you are the light of the world. It's an important assignment that we have. When I was in high school, I played football. And... While all positions are important, I was the kicker, and I could win or lose a game. No matter how well the rest of the team played, no matter how well the other team played, if the score was close enough, I could win or lose a game. And there weren't many moments that I had that could have been a win or lose moment, but I do remember one specifically in my sophomore year of high school. It was my first time actually playing um, high school football, and we were in a game we were losing 13-10. to 10. And there were six seconds left, and my coach sent me out to kick a field goal. And I knew I could not miss this. If I made it, it tied the game. And high school rules are weird, and it, we would have just ended in a tie. And if I missed it, we lost the game. So I knew I could not mess this up. So I went out there, took the kick, and I missed it. <laughs> we lost the game. But I knew, walking out there, that I could not fail because I would let my team down. In the military, they have orders. Everyone has their orders from the highest commander all the way down to the lowest rank in the military. Everyone has their orders, their assignments, their responsibilities that they have to obey to the letter to ensure the security of our nation. This emphatic pronoun mentioned here, you, indicates you alone. You alone are the light of the world and no one else. It's just us Christians no one else in the world can be that light. We are it. On December 19th, 1777, General George Washington and his 12,000 men stopped in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, after being tired from spending so much time marching. Many of the men had already fallen ill, and only one in three of his soldiers even had shoes. Soldiers were fed poorly, often eating what's called fire case, which was just a mixture of flour and water. Sometimes snow even had to be melted just so that they could have drinking water. Many of the men died from exposure because their clothing wasn't adequate. Typhoid, typhus, 
smallpox, dysentery, and pneumonia were also running rampant through the camp, killing many of the men. And their tight quarters and tents did not help with the diseases either. Washington stated multiple times that winter that conditions were so harsh that the army may have to disband because of how many of the men were dying. By June, when the troops finally moved out of Valley Forge, over 2,500 men had died of malnutrition, exposure, and disease. Many of the soldiers had deserted as well due to the poor conditions. Washington's army had to hold on, though. They were it. If their army of 12,000 men quit, there was no one else strong enough to lead in the war for independence. They held on, and they eventually made it through and won, but they were it. In the same way, we are it. We are the ones to present the gospel to the world. Jesus is not saying that you will be the light or that you can be the light, but you are the light. Believers are the means of getting the gospel to our lost and dying world. Ephesians 5 eight says, For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Jesus illustrates this assignment that we have in two ways. First, in verse 14, he mentions a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Pastor R. Kent Hughes once said this, Having traveled a little in Ecuador, I can testify that the light of the city of Quito, situated at 10,000 feet, illumines the sky for 75 miles around. It cannot be hidden. Yet, when you are in the great city itself, the light from the tiny villages higher above in the Andes is easily seen. Cities on hills cannot be hidden. Believers are like this. They are visible. There is no such thing as an invisible believer. How much of the light of the gospel can others see in you? We need to be all the light that we can be. We need to proclaim the gospel to those around us. Whether at school for the kids or maybe when you're out doing grocery shopping or when you're at work, how much of the light can the unsaved see in you? When I lived in England and I started playing a little bit of football there, um, I played on the bait on I played on the high school team on base because that was the only place that you could play football really because they didn't have tackle football in England. And I was raised in a Christian home, so I was taught, you know, you don't um, use foul language, don't make inappropriate jokes, all of this. And of course even a couple years ago in the public schools they use this kind of language all the time. It's basically their vocabulary now. And so I kept my testimony throughout football. I um, kept my language clean, I didn't use, like, laugh any appropriate jokes or use any of them. And near the end of the season, one of my teammates came up to me, and he said, he said, I just, I just wanted to say thank you. You know, he said, you don't use inappropriate language, you don't make inappropriate jokes, and he's like, I really appreciate that, you're setting the example for the rest of us. And while maybe he didn't mention right there and then that I was being Christian, he could see it. He could tell that there was something different. And in the same way, we need to be different so that others can see the difference, so that we can be able to share the gospel with them. He also illustrates this in verse 15. It says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. See, the houses in Jesus' day usually consisted of just a single room, so one single candle would be enough to light the whole house. And it was usually set on a projecting stone so that it would make the light even brighter. In this verse here, we have the word bushel. And a bushel can mean like a bowl or a basket. Nobody lights a lamp or a candle or lamps or anything like that just to cover it with a bowl or a basket. We put them on stands so that everyone can benefit from that light. On candlelit cave tours, you're given a single candle to light your way. Would you take that candle and like cover it with a basket or cover it with your hand? No, right? Of course not. You use that candle so that you can see through the darkness. In fact, a man and his sister on a candlelit cave tour once were given mirrors to hold behind the candles so that it projected the light even more. You might say there's too many people in the world to reach. 
It can't ever be done. But see, if all Christians just reached out to their world and to the people around them where they are, we can reach the whole world. A lamp in a house might not give a light to a ton of people, but it's enough light to make a difference. We can still be a light right where we are. We, can, we may not be much just by ourselves, but we can be enough to make a difference. We can tell people right in our circle of friends about the good news that Jesus saves. In Jesus' day, there were spiritual leaders called scribes and Pharisees, and these high-ranking people were given a special title, Nerola, which meant literally a lampstand of the world or light of the world. This title was for the elite spiritual leaders, those in high rank. But then Jesus turns to his disciples, who were considered the nobodies, and he looked at them and he said, you are the light of the world. See, God can use anyone to reach this world, and he wants to use you and me. Daily Mail says that the world population just topped 8 billion people at the end of last year. Three quarters of them have never even heard the gospel preached. And 41% of them have never even heard the name Jesus before. This tells us as Christians that we need to start getting busy. We need to start shining our light out to the world. Instead of focusing on the entire world, and I'm not saying we, need, we, can't, we shouldn't focus on the entire world, we need to reach the whole world. But instead of focusing on the whole world and being discouraged by the amount of people, we can focus on our world, our circle of influence, and start there. Who in your circle of influence can you tell about the good news of Jesus Christ? Your friends, your family, your coworkers, doctor, teacher, whatever it is. This is why we place such a great emphasis to the teens and boosters of bringing people to neighborhood Bible time. We, we tell them, we, we, set, we usually set a goal for, at least for the teens, we set a goal for attendance. And we tell them, we need to try and reach this by the end of the week. And many times it may seem like a really big number. But then we tell them, if one of you just went and told, if all of you went and told one of your friends to come to neighborhood Bible time, we would double the number. And then from there, if everyone there went and told another friend, we would double again. And it just continues to grow and grow. God wants to use you no matter who you are or where you are. You might be thinking, how do, I, how do I make this happen? How do I shine my light of the gospel to those around me? Do people see you showing love, responding in kindness, not getting annoyed, but serving others? working hard, being unselfish, doing gracious deeds and stuff like that? Or do they just see your grumpy side, your bad attitude or your hatred? Your testimony in front of the unbelievers will either draw people to Jesus or push them away from him. You decide. You can also speak of Jesus. Open your mouth and speak to others. God will use you. God will help you. I struggle with this myself. I don't, I'm not very much of a public speaker. I don't like to talk to people very much. I'm very much an introvert. But with God's grace, I'm able to talk to people. I'm able to preach. I'm able to do this neighborhood Bible time rally. God will help you. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? A preacher is not just someone that stands behind a pulpit and gives a Bible message to the congregation. A, pre a preacher is someone that goes out and proclaims the gospel to others. It's not just the job of one person to teach the whole city. It is our job as believers to go out and to preach the gospel, to proclaim the gospel to our world. We need to be a light to this world. This is the calling of God for all believers. But Jesus then gives us a caution. See, he gave us two illustrations about the city on the hill and then a lamp in a house to make a very clear point. It makes no sense to hide the light. Who lights a candle and puts it under a bowl or a bushel? It doesn't make any sense. 
but neither should a believer who is the light of the good news that Jesus Christ saves should he try to hide or conceal who he is in Jesus Christ. In other words, every Christian should be obvious. Others should be able to tell the difference. He should display Jesus Christ. Though it makes no sense to hide the light, as we've seen, many Christians still hide theirs. You know, you're thinking, what would keep a Christian from allowing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be evident in his or her life? Perhaps it's sin. For a Christian to live in sin is to live contrary to what the Lord wants us to do. Galatians 1 4 says, Who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Titus 2, verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Christ did not give us new life to live sinfully, nor did he give us light to hide it. We are to live out the truth of the gospel in our testimonies, which will then make way for us to be able to speak the gospel to our friends and family, to those that are unsaved. If you will live a godly lifestyle, telling others about Jesus will be that much easier. Soak in more of Christ and his righteousness so that you have more light to display. Be like a sponge. A sponge by itself can't do much. But once it soaks in the water, it's able to then distribute that water. In the same way, us by ourselves, we're not much. We're not anything. But if we, like a sponge, soak in Jesus Christ, we can then proclaim Jesus Christ. There's nothing to proclaim if there's nothing inside of you. A glow-in-the-dark football has to spend time in the light first to be of any use in the night. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Perhaps it's a selfish life. You may not be engaging in a sinful lifestyle, but if you are not sharing your faith of Jesus with others, you're a selfish person. What is, what's squelching your light? What is holding it down? Perhaps it's fear. Like I said, I don't talk to people very much. I struggle with this myself. I'm afraid to talk to people. Are we afraid to offend others? Afraid of being made fun of? Afraid, of, afraid of, that people won't like us? Think about it. If you won't share the truth about Christ, who is the only way to have sins forgiven and the only way to go to heaven, and we're doing it because we're afraid that we'll hurt other people's feelings? We talked about it in Sunday school. talked about offending others. It's not something new. It's happened for ages, for 2,000 years. But it doesn't change anything. In other words, we are willing for people to die and go to hell in order that they will continue to like us. But this is incredibly selfish. And I know I struggle with this myself. I'm not standing up here thinking that I'm so high and holy because I'm standing behind a pulpit preaching to a congregation. I know what I struggle with. And by God's grace, he's helped me through a lot of things. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Perhaps it's laziness. Ephesians 5.14 says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Perhaps it's forgetfulness. I forget a lot of things. I don't know. 
something's wrong with my head. I forget a lot of stuff, especially stuff my parents tell me to do. They tell me it's selective hearing, but I think otherwise. <laughs> we may be so absorbed in our lives that we've totally forgotten that God has, you, has us in this world to be a light. It's easy for us to be occupied by sports, education, entertainment, or maybe success in this life that we never think about eternity for ourselves or for others. We don't allow the reality of hell to sink in. A lot of people think of hell as just, just another place where bad people go and they just, they're, they're there for the rest of their lives. No, that's not how it works. In Revelation 20, it speaks about Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. It's literally another death for those who don't accept Christ as their Savior. And we're willing for people to go there so that we can stay okay in their eyes. So we can, for the teenagers, it's so that they can stay cool. So that people won't think they're weird. One preacher put it this way, the most sobering reality in the world today is that people are dying and going to hell today. Are we living in light of this reality or are we distracted by our own self-absorption? During the reign of King Edward in England, several men tried to move the English church in the direction of a more Bible-based Christianity. Two such men were Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer. Both men were powerful preachers and had great testimonies. And when Mary became Queen of England, she began persecuting and killing Christians. And Ridley and Latimer were arrested for proclaiming the gospel. When they were asked if they would deny their loyalty to biblical Christianity, they denied and bloody Queen Mary sentenced both preachers to death. Both Ridley and Latimer were burned at the stake in Oxford on October 16, 1555. As he was being tied to the stake, Ridley prayed, O Heavenly Father, I give unto thee most hearty thanks that thou hast called me to be a professor of thee, even unto death. I beseech thee, Lord God, have mercy on this realm of England and deliver it from all her enemies. The wood that he was on was green and burned only his lower parts without even touching his upper body. He was heard to repeatedly call out, Lord, have mercy upon me. I cannot burn. Let the fire come unto me. I cannot burn. One of the bystanders finally brought the flames to the top of the pyre to hasten his death. Latimer died much more quickly. And as the flames rose, he encouraged Ridley, Be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust shall never be put out. The martyrdoms of Ridley, Latimer, and Thomas Cranmer are today commemorated by a martyr's monument in Oxford. The faith they once died for will later be practiced freely in that land. As believers, we are not to live a sinful or a selfish life, but a spirit-filled life. But what does this look like? It looks like being a light in a dark world. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the Lord Jesus said that his disciples would receive power after that the Holy Spirit had come upon them and that they would then be witnesses. Basically, they would shine the truth of the gospel everywhere they were. In the power of the Spirit, those disciples preached the gospel and lived out the gospel and people were saved. They were radical and radiant for Jesus Christ. In training, we're told the story there's an MBT evangelist that went to a church and started a teen rally with two teenagers. It discouraged him a little bit, but he thought, I wonder what God can do with this rally. In the Sunday school hour, one of the boys got saved. And in the evening service, the other boy got saved. These two young men got so passionate for Jesus Christ that from 10 a.m. until the rally started in the evening. They would be going out, inviting people to come to the teen rally. There's even one time where the evangelist was like, all right, let's go ahead and we'll pause for lunch. And these boys said, you know, we're going to skip lunch today. We have too many friends and people we know that need to come to this rally because they need Jesus. The week started with two teens, but they ended with 55 teenagers in attendance, 45 of which trusted Christ as their Savior. And it's all because two guys 
decided that they were going to be the light of the gospel. Is our, are our lives anything like this, or have we hidden our light? Shine your light so that souls may be saved and that God might be glorified, as said in verse 14, or in verse 16, pardon me, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Psalm 115.1 says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. We are the light of the world. There is no plan B. We're it. There's no one else that can do this. Believers are God's means of taking Jesus to the world. God wants to use us. He doesn't need your availability or he doesn't need your ability, he wants your availability. Let your light shine. We must get the message of the gospel to our lost and dying world. As I said in the creation moments about how fireflies are able to refract that light to make it brighter, and about how man is trying to use that technology to make our own lights brighter, in that same way, we need the gospel in our lives, we need Jesus in our lives to be able to reflect the gospel out to the unsaved and dying world. This message, when I was studying this message, I, it convicted me. I grew up in a Christian home, but I grew up with that casual Christian lifestyle. I grew up knowing that a lot of these things were wrong, and I didn't do any of them, but I didn't think anything of them. I didn't, they didn't quite convict me as they should. And this continued on for a long time. And finally at a teen camp my junior year, and especially over the next couple of years, and so now where I'm at just finishing up Navy Bible time training, it showed me casual Christianity is not going to get us anywhere. Proclaiming it, Going out as casual Christians, we have that we have the light, but it's hidden, it's dim. Because we don't spend time in God's Word, we don't spend time praying with Him. Ever since these three weeks of neighborhood Bible time have started, ever since training has begun, I've all of a sudden had this desire to spend time in God's Word. The desire to get alone so that I can spend time with him. The desire to be able to talk with him in prayer. And we need to be like this to be able to go out and to preach the gospel to our lost and dying world, to our friends and family, our coworkers, those that we know.